Our top story, well, India has strongly objected to the UK for allowing Pakistani Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi to use the House of Commons as a stage for a Kashmir conference. Pakistan's Foreign Minister will be in the United Kingdom starting the 4th of February. Reports suggest that the Pakistan Foreign Minister has a packed Kashmir agenda during his visit. He is leading a Pakistan government effort to hold a seminar on the report of the UK All-Party Parliamentary Group on Kashmir. The panel is held headed by the British Member of Parliament, Chris Leslie. The report, which was brought out last November, is critical of the Indian Army's presence in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Qureshi is also expected to join anti-India protest marches in London. The British government, meanwhile, has assured India that Qureshi will not be on an official bilateral visit. Authorities also claim that no formal meetings are scheduled for him and the British government uh, by the British government. New Delhi is keeping a close watch after Qureshi made an unprecedented phone call to the Hudit leader Mirwaz Omar Farooq. Qureshi invited Mirwaz to a conference being held in London. India summoned Pakistan High Commissioner Sohail Mahmood and lodged a strong protest over the telephone, uh, over the telephone conversation initiated by the Pakistani Foreign Minister to the separatist leader. There are these two faces of the government which are uh, play at the same time. One face talks about peace, uh, good relations with India, and the other face takes action which are completely anti-India. In other news, in a bid to tackle severe pollution, Bangkok has resorted to extreme measures of using drones to lessen the dust particles in the city's air. A fleet of drones will spray water into Bangkok's air. Weather experts hope that this measure will eliminate some of the pollution that has covered the capital skyline uh, since December. And uh, city workers have also resorted to spraying water from trucks and high rises in an effort to lessen the number of dangerous particles in the sky. Thailand's Pollution Control Board has said that the particle pollution in the city has risen to dangerous levels and the city is only the, at the brink of a massive health crisis. Yesterday, toxic smog forced Bangkok authorities to issue an unprecedented order to shut nearly 450 schools. Authorities have also resorted to cloud seeding to provoke rain spraying over passes with water to catch micropollutants and even ask people not to burn incense sticks and paper during Chinese New Year celebrations. Well, moving on to other news now, the United States and China have opened a pivotal round of two-day-long high-level trade talks. The talks are aimed at digging out from their months-long trade war amid deep differences over China's practices on influential property and technology transfer, intellectual property and technology transfer. At the head of the 30-person delegation from Beijing, Chinese Vice Premier met with the U.S. trade representative as well. The talks began two days after the United States charged the Chinese telecommunications company Huawei and its chief financial officer Meng Wanzhou. U.S. Treasury Secretary Stephen Munichin expressed optimism, saying that significant progress can be achieved during this week's high-level trade negotiations in Washington. The two sides have just a month remaining in the 90-day truce declared in December. Should the talks fail, U.S. import duties on $200 billion in Chinese imports are due to, uh, to more than double on March 2nd. Something economists say would help knock the wind out of the global economy's sails. And well, we are joined by Patrick Falk, uh, correspondent from Beijing. And Patrick, what were the reactions in the trade discussions from the Chinese side uh, at the briefing earlier today? Well, reporters, as you can imagine, were very keen to get updates on the trade talks. But when asked for details and what the government's expectations were for coming out of them, spokesperson for the Ministry of Commerce, Gao Feng, simply said, he had no information at this time. Now, he was also asked about this issue of IP protection, which we know is a key concern for the Americans in these discussions. Uh, he said that China had done a remarkable amount over the last year to strengthen legislation in that regard and also said that a judicial framework had been set up to crack down on illegal activity related to IP protection. 
Now, he also spoke about a significant development that's taken place here in the last couple of days. The National People's Congress Standing Committee has just finalized new legislative proposals to streamline foreign investments. They're essentially aimed at leveling the playing field for foreign companies so that they're treated in the same way that Chinese companies are here. And they also have provisions in them for IP protection. Analysts say it's significant not just because of the timing, but also because of the speed at which these proposals have been pushed through. And uh, perhaps it's likely that negotiators in Washington will be pointing towards these efforts in their discussions. Right. And so what's the feeling in China about whether there will actually be any progress made in the round of talks? We know the U.S. has said that the talks are positive. Well, there is a lot of skepticism about what these talks can achieve exactly, given both sides simply don't see eye to eye on certain issues. But media here is reporting that there is a lot of optimism as well, that at least some progress will be made. Uh, the Global Times had an article saying the fact that Liu He traveled to Washington so close to the Spring Festival holidays was a positive sign and showed that China uh, was sincere about trying to achieve some sort of breakthrough. At the same time, the same article said that there were dark clouds hanging over these talks and pointed in particular towards uh, the U.S. indictments against uh, Huawei. And in a separate article uh, in the Global Times, it also uh, talked about uh, economic figures that were recently released by the Ministry of Commerce, uh, saying that outbound investment from China to North America, notably Canada as well as the U.S., had fallen uh, by as much as 70 percent in the last year. And it suggested that uh, the U.S. would suffer if this trade war continues and that uh, outbound investments from China would continue to grow, but uh, perhaps the business will be taken elsewhere. All right, Patrick, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Well, in other news now, it's a war of tech giants. The cold war between Apple and Facebook is further ratcheting up, and it all started after Facebook was discovered to be snooping on iPhone users in an unethical way. It was reported that Facebook bypassed Apple's App Store's approval process and promoted teenagers to unethically install a data-collecting app to mine user data. Facebook, in return, paid users aged between 13 to 35 uh, up to $20 a month for full access to their devices. It allowed Facebook to track users' location, uh, app usage, spending habits and other activities. The program is a clear violation of their agreement with Apple. And this didn't go down well with Apple, which responded aggressively and cut off Facebook's access to all testing tools that the social networking, networking giants use to ensure that its apps are ready for use on Apple devices. But the war between the tech uh, behemoths doesn't end here. After Facebook, now Google is receiving flack for obtaining user details in an unethical way as well. According to a media report, Google has been running screen-wise meters, which is a private app for monitoring the iPhone usage as well. In the backdrop of the entire controversy, Google has removed the app from iOS and apologized for it. According to Google, it was a mistake, but a spokesperson also insisted that they have been upfront with users who can opt out of the program at any time, and that is totally voluntary. Well, tech giants like Facebook and Google may have disabled their versions of spying apps, but it leaves us wondering how safe is our data online. Well, less than a day to go for the last budget of the 16th Lok Sabha and the Narendra Modi government will present an interim budget tomorrow. Expectations are running high. Will it be a populist one or a reform budget? The president in his speech to the joint session of parliament listed GST, demonetization and health care for all as big measures taken by the BJP government. Earlier speaking ahead of the parliament session, Prime Minister Narendra Modi as well appealed for smooth conduct of legislative business during the budget session. Listen in. I hope that all of our members are इन जनभावनाओं को ध्यान में रखते हुए इस बजट सत्र का उपयोग 
गहराई से विस्तार से जानकारियों से भरपूर चर्चा में हिस्सा लें अपने विचार रखें सदन को लाभान्वित करें सरकार को भी लाभान्वित करें और हमारे पास इस सत्र में जितना भी काम है उसका सर्वाधिक उपयोग हमारे सभी आदरणीय सांसद करें ऐसी मेरी उनसे अपेक्षा है so as we said well india is bracing for a budget just a couple of months ahead of the general election the budget before elections is invariably colored by politics around it and governments do tend to resort to populist measures to appease to the electorate it's even considered at par for the uh, at par with the course that they need to take but in the year 2019 india is the fastest growing large economy in the world according to many economists and experts but it's an economy that is faced with many risks and uncertainties those same economists also so warn that india needs to be more disciplined in terms of its fiscal deficit despite all the praise heaped around the world the indian economy is in need of a booster shot that can create jobs and increase the purchasing power of the near billion and a half population there are opportunities a plenty to do that and in that context budget 2019 gains huge significance despite it being a so called interim budget from the farmer to the middle class from the industrialist to the startups there are certain expectations across the board let's take a look at those expectations well the rural economy needs a real kick start if india has hopes of crossing the 8% growth figure so all eyes on what the budget 2019 can do for uh, for that at the same time many will be keeping a close watch on what kind of allocations for schemes to address farm distress are being announced after all it's a vote bank that the present government absolutely needs to please if it wants to retain power the anger of the middle class has certainly been rising and to assuage uh, that uh, a higher income exemption limit is ex- something that is keenly awaited as well as always part of a rise in tax exemption limit for home loans now specific projects and plans with an outline of uh, the kind of job creation they will entail will be a primary focus while announcement of the universal basic income scheme uh, front is also something that is expected corporate india will be looking at the investment outlay for creating fresh infrastructure be it new roads railway lines or any other project because that means big government business for them in particular real estate companies who are suffering from some of the worst times will be hoping uh, for some kind of relief as well in this budget medium and small businesses meanwhile will have their fingers crossed for a cut in gst rates as well do expect that uh, for 2018-19 the government will come very close to sticking to its 3.3% fiscal deficit and we expect for next year there will be another effort to consolidate the deficit modestly Now remember the February budget uh, is less important because really what the government's asking for is parliament to approve expenditures for the next 4 months you have a full budget in July and that's when all these assumptions will be revisited but our sense is the government's still going to you know try and reduce the deficit uh, the question is if there is new spending on an agricultural package that is being spoken about um, how will that be financed will that be financed out of existing welfare programs will let be financed out of new revenue measures i think it's important that if there is new spending the government lay out how that will be financed so that we don't have any new unfunded liabilities going into the next uh, uh, government's uh, uh, regi- uh, t- uh, tenure government can announce all kinds of schemes uh, in 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 the uh, speech i mean it can lay down how uh, it would uh, what it would do for the farmers or the poor or, or uh, uh, say uh, that they would introduce new schemes so uh, uh, that really doesn't affect the second part of the budget which is the actual hard numbers uh, uh, which on the expenditure side uh, and the tax side so i expect uh, definitely the government would have a bold framework in the speech but my uh, my guess would be at this point that as far as the budget numbers are concerned uh, though there would be more like uh, token expenditures 
and tax adjustments. There would not be uh, a massive increase, what could be called uh, uh, populist uh, in, in the usual uh, sense of the word. Arguing that um, you know India should gradually consolidate, so certainly um, we want India to persist on that path. Um, uh, see the deficits decline and also the debt levels to decline at almost seven percent, a seven percent deficit. If you look at the general government, if we add the states and almost seventy percent debt, these are relatively high levels for um, an emerging economy. And we want to have the space that when there's a negative shock, you know, the fist can help. Mm. And so I think. Um, we would want to see a continuation of that um, of that uh, consolidation path, and especially also that consolidation needs to happen at the overall public sector. So, some of one of the issues we've seen, we have seen that the budget, uh, central budget, has has um, been declining the budget deficit. But on the other hand, we've also seen some extra budgetary activities picking up. Mm -hmm. So, it's it's important to take a global view, and uh, and to uh, create this fiscal space that we need, you know, to be ready if, if there's a negative shock. Well, moving on now, and after Chief Justice of India Ranjan Gogoi and Justice A.K. Sikri, now Justice N.V. Ramana has become the third judge to recuse himself from hearing a plea challenging the center's decision to appoint M. Nageshwar Rao as the interim CBI director. This is the third recusal this month by a judge from hearing this petition, which recusing while recusing himself from hearing the contentious PIL. Justice Ramana told the petitioners that he knew the interim CBI chief Nageshwar Rao personally, and therefore it would have been inappropriate for him to hear the PIL at this time. The petition states that the selection panel was completely bypassed and had no role in the appointment of Nageshwar Rao, thereby rendering the appointment illegal as it is in violation of the procedure for appointment of the director. The CBI laid out in the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act. Advocate Prashant Bhushan has filed a PIL on January 15, 2019, and since then the PILs have not been heard by the first four Supreme Court benches yet. It is likely to be heard by Justice Arun Mishra's bench now.